This is The Curious Gamer, a show about the culture, design, and joy of games. I'm Devin Pulaski. So, um, how about you go first? Uh, um... <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> uh, my name is Landon. I'm 12 years old, and I am going into 7th grade. I've played video games since, like, I was 4 Less. Less than 4. Yeah, I've got a videotape of you playing video games at one. Really? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I should do. Yeah, so I'm I'm Dad. I'm I'm Brian. Yeah, I'm I'm 38 at this point, so I'm I'm dating myself a little bit. I currently work as a uh, data scientist for a bank, but I had a, a previous uh, career as a as a scientist. And games, video games, have sort of been um, a, a staple for me since probably before I can remember. You know, all these all these years later, I'm, I'm definitely still gaming, and I definitely make it a point to game, you know, with friends and family. Um, but in addition to that, I still play, you know, solo games by myself. Video games and parents often go together about as well as peanut butter and toothpaste. That is to say, it's pretty common for parents to have a low threshold of tolerance for video games. Chances are you know exactly what I'm talking about. Parents yanking game controllers out of their kids' hands, saying that they can't play until they finish some other task, or that the games they're playing are too violent, or that they ought to go outside, or do virtually anything else instead. This dynamic is as old as video games themselves, and the reasons for it are actually pretty obvious. If you're a parent and you didn't grow up with games and are learning about them primarily through your children, then chances are they'll feel extremely foreign, complicated, and even a little scary. And if you're a younger parent who actually did grow up with games as a regular part of life, you maybe haven't kept up with them into adulthood, and games have changed so much that they may be altogether unrecognizable anymore to you. All this mixes together with messages about games from mainstream media, which often perpetuates negative attitudes and stereotypes about games, and the stigmas surrounding the people who play them. In turn, parents both old and young internalize this fear about games, even for parents who had a positive experience growing up with them. This causes people to let go of games as they transition into adulthood and parenthood. All these factors, and more, culminate in a perfect storm that drives the divide between people who enjoy games and the people who don't. I believe there's a different dynamic on the horizon, a better relationship between parents, their kids, and video games. I see a future where most parents already enjoy games and use them to enrich their lives and then pass on this experience to their kids and enjoying this activity together. There are already plenty of credible studies that discuss the benefits of playing games with your kids and the kinds of bonding that comes from it. But while studies and research are certainly important, I believe that stories about actual families and their experiences can have the most impact. These real life game playing families can act as a model for other parents to follow. Parents who treat games not as something foreign, but as an exciting activity that can help you learn new things and build relationships that last a lifetime. Today, I'm talking to one of these families, a data scientist and PhD named Brian, and his son, Landon. I, I must have been three or four, uh, but we were at a bar, and I can distinctly remember uh, the the graphics and the paneling, and it was one of those Super Mario Brothers uh, stand-up arcade machines. And I do remember being just absolutely fascinated uh, with it at the time. And I think I think my parents and maybe some other uh, friends that they were with were were sort of taking turns playing, and I was I was just absolutely enamored with it. Brian recalls fond memories of his early childhood, when his family got an Atari game console, 
he distinctly remembers his mom being really good at the game Qbert, while his dad excelled at Pac-Man. But as the years went on, things started to change, and what was once an activity enjoyed by the whole family started to turn certain members away, specifically Brian's dad. So, you know, he has a huge heart, and, and he definitely saw that the, uh, that the video game uh, system, you know, that was out was sort of new technology, and he absolutely wanted it for his kids, and um, both my sister and I got a lot of enjoyment out of it, but... You know, in his heart of hearts, uh, he was very, very much into sports and, and a lot of outdoorsy things like hunting and fishing. I was also very, very involved in um, in, in fishing with him, and I, I learned to be a bit of a marksman. And um, I also ended up being a really, really good athlete. In addition to that, I had this love of games, and I, I think he was really, really rejectful of that because that was something so foreign to him. You know, where when he was growing up, you know, if it was a nice sunny day, you you went outdoors. Like you just went and you just did stuff. You know, he kind of considered it as as a big waste of time. In hindsight, you know, I've sort of turned my love of gaming and and I like to consider, you know, the critical thinking and the puzzle solving as big stepping stones and the things that have sort of shaped my my career and my profession. You know, I, I like I said, I was a scientist and, you know, now I work as a data scientist as like video games being very formative in, you know, facilitating those those skills to develop. And I think this many years later, he's uh, sort of at a, at a big understanding that, you know, video games did play a large role in getting me to to where I'm at now. Because of the pandemic, he can't be in person to watch Landon play sports. And at this point, um, you know, sports might be over with uh, uh, for Landon. Landon actually has a uh, special condition called severe hemophilia. His blood doesn't clot. And so while he's allowed to play sports while he's young, there's sort of some like big gray areas as to whether it's a good idea to continue to play high speed sports as he gets older. So his soccer career might be over and we are setting up Twitch streams uh, for Landon to play Rocket League and have his relatives be an audience for watching him play and sort of develop. And so we do this uh, once a week and it's really kind of fascinating because they can't watch him play sports and he's not really going to. And this is sort of the thing that's replaced that. So they're they're watching him like train and get better at a virtual sport. And I'm sort of tickled to death by this because they're actually having a really good time doing it. For those of you that don't know, Twitch is the most popular site to stream video games, with many popular streamers pulling in hundreds of thousands of people to watch live. We'll get back to Landon and his experience streaming a little later. So Brian, I want to go back in time a little bit to when you were really young and first exposed to games. So if your parents, you know, particularly your dad, eventually fell out of favor with games, did you continue to just play alone or did you play with other people too? Yeah, my sister and my cousins were really my my gaming partners you know so we would we would play uh the mario games together and then my cousins especially they were uh, a little bit older than i am and so they they actually started paying their own money to buy games and they had a much bigger library so going to their house was a was a special treat because they had all the games i didn't um and so our our relationship there was you know definitely uh forged by by playing games together And then going through grade school, it, it really felt like any of the friendships that I had made that, that were lasting at all, video games ended up being the icebreaker. I still have uh, friends to this day that we started gaming, you know, so many years ago and we continue to game every single weekend. One, one in particular uh, was a friend that I made when we lived uh, for a short stint in Illinois. We started gaming every Saturday night and we haven't stopped since. 
you know, 2004, 2005. It's been every, you know, every Saturday since then that, that him and I have played. Um, and then in addition to that, so we're originally from Michigan and we live in Connecticut now. One of the things that we do twice a year is we go home for a week and usually around the holidays and then once during the summer to visit family and friends. And invariably, we always have uh, a single day that I get together with my high school buddies and since they're big sports fans and they're less gamers now, you know, some of them didn't really continue the gaming thing, but we'll always play four player cooperative FIFA or four player cooperative Madden or something sports related. And it's just something that like we all do, you know, every time we get together. And then actually one more on top of that, there's there's uh, like I said, another another friend that I've that I had since uh, my teenage years. And every Christmas we get together with now the kids uh, and his brothers. And uh, he's got a gigantic Steam library and a, and a big projector in his basement. And we sit down and we we play video games all night. And this is like every Christmas, you know, where when the holidays are sort of a busy schedule and we, we, we uh, carve out at least one night to all get together and game. So, yeah, I would, I would definitely say that, you know, um, video games have definitely shaped... Uh, or played a big role in in the bonding experience that I've had um, with my friends over the years. I want to pause here for a little while, because I thought a lot about what Brian told me here. It's that social quality of games, and how this is the hook that drives people to stick with games as they transition from childhood to adulthood and thus keeping it a part of their lives forever. Brian's social experience with games is a little similar to my own. Almost all of my close family members or friends I've made over the years live far away from me, and for some of them, I'd be lucky to see them just once for the year. And while a phone call or Zoom call or text might be fine for keeping in contact, video games help keep that connection extra strong. Games give us something to do. And yes, it may be virtual, but it provides a space for us both to just exist in and an experience for us to share. And this is especially important during the pandemic, when even those infrequent in-person annual visits are no longer possible for the foreseeable future. The best part of all of this is not even the games themselves, but the chance to catch up while playing them. One minute, my friends and I might be talking about the game we're playing and what we should be doing, but in my experience, the majority of the talk then shifts to conversations about our lives, what we've been up to, how work is going, what's been going well, and what's stressing us out. But let's not forget the power of the games themselves. So Brian, you know, for someone like you who has a lot of different interests, including you know, playing sports, what is unique about games that you can't find anywhere else? This is kind of the way that that I see it. So, you know, kids will go outside and they'll play they'll play sports and there always seems to be sort of a, a competition to it. I I actually am a very, very competitive person. I've, uh, you know, spent a lot of years. I was a four sport athlete in high school and I even played some um, uh, a bit of college soccer. And so, you know, competition isn't isn't foreign to me. But whenever I'm together with my friends, I think I hate beating my friends at a game as much as I hate losing to them at a game. And so I, I'm always a bigger fan of, of trying to accomplish something together. You know, like let's get our brains together and let's figure a puzzle out or let's, let's overcome the next level or the next challenge together. And I think video games, um, you know, even, even the ones going back to the, to the late eighties and early nineties, there, there were always ways where you could play cooperatively a lot easier, you know, together than, than maybe you could like doing some sort of sports related thing. I think that's probably one of the reasons that, you know, attract attracted me to, to playing video games with friends so much is that you could, you could always sort of work together to get to the next level or accomplish the next thing. As great as all the social bonds, friendly competition, and cooperative problem solving are, it's worth taking a step back and recognizing something else going on here. And that's that all these benefits of games I'm describing are enjoyed largely by a male audience. Games are often made by men and heavily marketed to men and the act of sharing games socially is highly encouraged between men. But 
the same isn't always true for women, who are often left out of this equation. The game industry and gaming culture at large can be a hostile place for women to participate in. It's understandable that many women give it up as they grow older. And while an individual girl or woman might be very interested in games, if none of their peers want to share it with them, it can be a pretty isolating experience and understandable they would pursue other hobbies, media, and activities that favor more readily available social connections among other women. All this and more are important issues that video games as a whole has a long way to address and fix. I'm largely glossing over this topic, so I'd like to explore it in detail in another episode someday soon. But before I move on from this point, I think it's still worth noting the positive force games can have on male friendships. There's a popular study by the Royal Society of Open Science, titled Sex Differences in Social Focus Across the Life Cycle of Humans. Not exactly a thrilling headline, but the study does conclude that, by around the age of 30, friendships between men sharply decline. There may be many reasons for this, but anecdotally, I think much of this stems from the fact that men are not encouraged in our society to form emotionally deep relationships. Instead, men are encouraged to pursue advancement in career, wealth, power, etc. This is not to say this is exclusive to men, nor is it to say that it's impossible to have both a successful career and meaningful friendships. But it is one way to possibly explain the decline in friendships many men experience in their lifetime. However, while this isn't part of the study I mentioned before, there is evidence to suggest that many men are avoiding this friendless trap thanks to spending time together through video games. As for Brian, well, we've already heard about all the friends and family he keeps in contact with through games, and there's still more to come. So tell me about this other crew you play with, and you do this every Sunday? Yeah, that's right. So Sunday nights, there are actually uh, two, um, Adam and Jason, uh, were both graduate students uh, with me, and then uh, two other friends, uh, Sean, who I alluded to previously, he is the director of uh, e-learning at a university in Michigan. Another one who is uh, a newly minted PhD, and he has his first university position coming up uh, in the fall, um, and he's a, a psychology PhD. So we've got, you know, uh, just a, a bunch of PhDs, and uh, the five of us get together and game on Sunday nights. A quick side note, after our interview, Brian wrote to me saying he mentioned his friends Adam, Jason, and Sean, but was mortified. He forgot to mention the psychology professor's name, which is Mark. See, Mark, don't worry. Brian's got you covered. So Landon, I feel like I've let your dad hug the spotlight. So I'm curious, do you have the same sort of, you know, first time memories of video games from way back? Like, was there a specific game you can remember first playing? Definitely Mario Sports was like that game for me. When I first saw the game, it was so cool because there is motion controls, like you can swing the controller to move the character and stuff. And I played that game for like really, really long time. I've been playing Super High, like Super High is one of my favorite games playing right now uh definitely minecraft is one of them and valorant oh valorant i i just started playing that the other day you just started playing yeah like just this past weekend actually nice i do play lots of roblox with my friends though because it's free and stuff right but you and your dad also mentioned the game rocket league and how it's become a pretty big deal in your house right now uh, and just a quick note for our listeners, in Rocket League, you're basically playing soccer, but instead of people, uh, you're playing as little cars driving around the field. And the ball is huge, so your cars are crashing into the ball and trying to knock it into the net. It sounds pretty silly, and when you see it in action, it's just as ridiculous as you can imagine it is. But anyone who's played it can tell you it's extremely deep and difficult to master. Tell me how you and your family got into Rocket League. Yeah, um, I can elaborate on that further. And it ended up being really, really serendipitous because the pandemic was about to hit. So we really started to cut our teeth into the game in January and February. And then by the time March hit, it was kind of like the only thing that we had to do because the spring soccer season was about to roll around. And I'm like, well, I guess this is going to kind of replace soccer now. So... (laughs) 
So when we first started talking, you mentioned that you set up a Twitch stream so that Landon can play Rocket League and your family can watch him do this live. So how did that all come about? So there's a couple of ways that we handled that. And, and I, I might be a little bit more strict than other parents, but you know, Landon is still 12. One of the things that I told him right away, because he has friends that are doing YouTube channels and, and doing Twitch streaming. It's like what the kids want to do, right? It's what the it's what their idols are doing. So it's what they want to do too. When he came to me with this, my initial reaction was, oh, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> We're not going to have you doing public facing streams. Um, but then I thought about it a second time and I thought, okay, I'm going to extend to you the olive branch that, that maybe I didn't get when I was your age. And I thought, okay, so you're interested in, in streaming. And then I immediately thought that, okay, well, there's relatives that are never going to watch you play sports again. So we can connect those dots right there. And then the, the idea is that maybe you can learn something that you didn't have any knowledge of previously. So I, I'm not pressuring him at all into what he wants to be uh, when he's older. I, I, I ended up being a scientist and then transitioned into more of like a, um, an analyst in, in data science. Uh, but he doesn't have to do those things. I want him to know that I'll be there for him if he does, but he doesn't have to. If he takes a big interest in broadcasting, you know, if this is something that's piquing his interest, well, let's let's give broadcasting a try. You know, why don't you play a game while reading chat and try to respond to those people while still playing your game at a high level? What my wife Jennifer and I do is we sit down and we moderate the chat. And the first thing that he said right out of the gates, like after his first stream to his relatives, was that was a lot tougher than I expected it to be. And I said, I said, right, you know, like it is public facing and I'm not discouraging other people from joining the chat. But I told him that you're not advertising this to anybody. I would rather there not be other people from the public that are that are coming in. If you're 12 and you're showing yourself to be a prodigy, that might be something that people would legitimately want to tune into. And, and I said, if you start to get to that level, to the point where you can instruct adults or people older than you on the things that they're doing right or wrong, and that there's content they might actually find worthwhile, then I said, okay, you know, that's a different story. And you, we might entertain the idea of you being a little bit more public facing. I I reserve the right to backtrack on that at any point because like I said, I, I don't want my 12 year old having delusions of grandeur that he's going to be, you know, this, this wealthy tw Twitch streamer. But at the same time, I don't want to take away the, the incentive and the drive for him to, you know, train in something and watch himself get better in addition to learn and understand more about how to talk to a crowd, how to manage the expectations of an audience, and all of the little things that the that the Twitch streamers do that you don't really see in the in the background. You know, to that end, if he does it and it doesn't end up being big, he still takes something away from it that he wouldn't have previously. Now, Brian, as someone who really understands games, I'm curious what you would say to people who don't. Like, what would you offer to them about how games have changed and how they have diversified over time? The the one thing that has been really, really cool, uh, fascinating to, to watch with gaming over the years is their ability, like developers' ability to branch out and to try to grab the attention of a wide breadth of audiences. So there's there's video games like Animal Crossing, where my my wife at her core is not a gamer. Um, she has played some uh, MMOs with us, like Final Fantasy XIV. But the things that sort of grab her attention about that game are about the glamour items, you know. And and so like the 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 next thing that 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 she wants to get, and she enjoys you know doing doing some of the other events and and things like that. Just want to make a quick editor's note here and say that Final Fantasy 14, yeah, that game's like one of the 
biggest, most complex, most hardcore games there is. So Brian, I think your wife is kind of a core gamer. Okay. This is a whole can of worms for another episode. So I'll shut up for now. Right now. Uh, she's really, really excited about animal crossing and it's sort of the same idea. It, I like to call it the Sims part two, right? You're, you're networking with the people on the Island and you're making trades and you're, you know, you're building up your things. There's, there's a game out there for everybody. There really is. There's, there's, if you try something that they like and and you don't necessarily like it don't don't stop there you know especially with uh the on demand gaming now with things like steam and xbox games pass and stuff like that there's the availability to try new games is so prevalent it's really worth your while to sort of check things out in in uh what might you know, pique your interest in, in what might not. And if it doesn't, you know, keep searching. I, I can almost guarantee you that there will be something out there. And, you know, and as a quick example, Landon definitely took to Fortnite, Valorant, and, uh, you know, Minecraft and Roblox. And I know, uh, you know, there's sort of like two game genres in there. I don't understand Fortnite at all. I figured, you know, when he started getting into Fortnite, I was like, yeah, all right, I'm going to show him a thing or two. One, I was terrible. And two, I felt like I was hiding for 10 minutes and then dying and restarting. Like that was the whole game. And while I do love a jump, you know, uh, jumping tracks here, while I do love games like Terraria, for whatever reason, I never got into Minecraft or, or Roblox. So, you know, if, if Fortnite is, is a wildly popular game uh, with the younger crowd right now, especially like the preteens. If that's your kid's cup of tea, it doesn't necessarily have to be your cup of tea. You know, like I said, just just look out there a little bit for something that might pique, pique your interest. You know, chances are you're going to end up meeting somewhere in the middle. I think what keeps a lot of parents from exploring games at all is this elephant in the room and that's violence. You know, I've heard so many parents and just other adults tell me that violent video games basically ruins all video games for them. You know, someone like you or me knows that there's just as many, if not way more, video games that feature no violence whatsoever. But when a lot of the most heavily marketed games feature violence and the marketing is primarily what you see, then yeah, I can kind of understand why it's easy to see that all video games are violent. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good point. I think my argument to that is the reason that a game like Fortnite is cool is not because of the guns. It's because of the the competition and I guess the 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 personal rewards that you get out of out of playing it. So whether it's winning or whether it's putting a cool skin on your character, you know, there there are video games out there that are that are massively violent. You know, we've had to talk a lot about that through the years, especially uh, because we got Landon involved in video games so young. Then when he started hearing about games like Grand Theft Auto from his friends, you know, we had to be like, no, 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 no. Like not, not yet. You know, and I don't really want to trash any, any games, but there, there's one that just came out recently called Dead by Daylight. And, you know, he's 12. And so he's starting to get, you know, seventh grade is when you start really like, you know, uh, exploring a lot of different media, at least for a lot of, uh, I would say your average kid. Um, But I saw him playing Dead by Daylight the other day. And I, we actually had a little bit of a, 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 not a tiff, but, you know, we butted heads a little bit because, you know, he said, well, why can't I play this? And I said, I said, Landon, you're, the the things that you're doing in this game are especially especially violent and i just don't i said when you start to get older i'm gonna i'm gonna clear out of your way but i said you're still young and i said i i just don't feel comfortable with you playing that there are violent like very violent video games out there but you know as popular as dead by daylight is it doesn't hold a candle to a game like Fortnite, which is given out freely with the idea that people are going to pay into the game, you know, for uh, for various glamour items and stuff like that. The kids aren't excited about the violence. The kids are excited about the the gameplay that's in there. You know, it's the dance routines. It's it's the noises. And if you watch any Fortnite play, 
it's actually very, very cartoony. There have been a lot of crossover events with very, very popular, you know, pulp, pop culture uh, media like like Star Wars and, and Marvel comics and things like that. You know, one of the advantages of things like whether it's watching a movie with your kids or playing a game with your kids is it it sort of helps you to better understand or dictate the rules around those things, right? So if, if you give Fortnite a try, maybe you see it in a little bit of a different light or maybe you don't. And then if, if you have a little bit more knowledge about video games, you can sort of pick something that tailors a little bit more to what they would want to play. So, you know, if you have a six, seven year old and you're sort of not OK with them with a cartoon machine gun going and gunning people down, maybe you play something like uh, one of the uh, I really love the Lego uh, video games. You know, you can play cooperatively together and solve little puzzles and stuff like that. And I think if you sort of extended that olive branch and you found some interest in it too, you know, you sort of diffuse any of the tension that they might have because their friends are playing Fortnite and they can't do it yet. I think this is an excellent point. As parents, our job is to help shape the knowledge, skills, interests, and values of our child and we help cultivate the kind of taste our children have in media. Parents have been passing down their favorite books, music, and movies for many generations. And as time goes on, and new types of media emerge, it's important to have literacy about this media so that we can help prepare our children to absorb it. These days, you hear this kind of thing a lot about social media. That if you're concerned about your kid misusing social media or of being a victim of the negative aspects of it, then you should practice healthy habits on your own social media accounts. That way you can model this behavior to your kids. The same is true for video games. If you ignore playing games yourself, and if you completely ignore video games as a whole, then your child will be left to figure them out on their own, which may turn out completely fine. But there may also be times where it would be helpful as a parent to intervene, or at least offer guidance. And you can't offer that to your child if you lack the basic literacy and fundamentals about games. But like Brian also said, all you have to do is take a little time and see what's out there. And today, there are now more affordable and accessible options than ever, making it all the easier to dip your toe into this vast interactive medium. And of course, I'm always here to offer resources and guidance on what to play, whether you're a parent, child, or anyone else. Brian, thank you so much for talking to me. You know, I think your story is just really fascinating. And I also really think it could be a model for other people to follow. That's that's awesome. Hey, whatever whatever ends up coming out, like it, this has actually been been really cool. Um, not just like talking to you, but like reminiscing and like all the things, you know, that uh, video games through like my stages of life. And I, it's it's been, it's actually been a lot of fun thinking about it and talking about it. So thanks for the time, Devin. Thank you, Brian. And you too, Landon. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend. You too. You too. Take care. Today, parents and video games don't often mix. But Brian, Landon, and their family demonstrate that great things happen when they do. There is a time and place for every piece of media Video games, like anything, should not be the sole piece of your media equation. They must be balanced out with a wealth of other experiences. But if games are left out of your life entirely right now, try adding them back in. You might be thrilled at what you discover. The Curious Gamer was written, produced, and voiced by me, Devin Pulaski. I also composed all the music in this episode. Please subscribe to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can watch and listen to the show on YouTube and Instagram. So it really, really helps the show out if you could leave a five-star review or share the show with a friend who you think would be interested. You can do this and learn more about the show at thecuriousgamer.org. And once again, if you're looking for a game to play right now, you can write to me using the built-in message form on the website. Thank you for listening. And remember this, no matter what you're doing, whether you're feeling up or down, you're never too old to enjoy your life and play.